The crisis that occurred in Crimea in February and March of 2014 is presented by the Western media using such terms as Russian invasion, Russian annexation and Russian hostility. As far as I am concerned, all of these labels are almost completely false. They are misrepresentations that the Western world chooses to use in order to paint the story in a manner that suits its overall narrative and underlying geopolitical agenda. In other words, we can't let the truth get in the way of geopolitical aims. The basis for this video is a series of letters that I have received at the time from my online girlfriend who lives in Simferopol, Crimea. She has provided me with the perspective of a real Crimean person. I give infinitely more weight to her real-time personal account of events than I do to the misrepresentations that are disseminated through our Western media. The first point to make is that the crisis in Crimea began immediately after the violent coup in Kiev overthrew the democratically elected Yanukovych government. The moment these thugs got the job done in Kiev, they headed down to Crimea to create trouble there. At this point, it needs to be understood that some Ukrainians, mainly from western regions of Ukraine, harbour an intense Russian hatred, as well as an extreme fascist, ultra-nationalist ideology. Here's a grab from right sector leader, Alexander Muzichku. As long as I live, I will fight against Jews, communists and Russian scum. This hatred dates back in history and earlier generations. For these guys, this conflict is very much about their Russian hatred and extremist right-wing ideology. Crimea was the region of Ukraine with the highest percentage of ethnic Russian people. And therefore, Crimea was the next target after Kiev. <laughs> Их покидали в обочину и грейдером их просто закапывали. Человек стоит на коленях, ему говорят, ты из Украины, а он говорит, слава России, ему втыкают в горло нож. А это... Вечер 20 февраля 2014 года. Автотрасса в районе города Корсун-Шевченковский Черкасской области. Очевидцы зафиксировали массовые избиения крымчан, пытавшихся выразить свое несогласие с Киевским Майданом. Это был настоящий погром. Потому что он это все время кричал. Мы приедем вам в Крым, если вы не будете говорить на, на украинской мове, мы вас всех не знать гимн Украины. This footage shows a raid on a right sector apartment by the polite green men on March 16 in Simferopol. This computer screensaver shows a map of Crimea in the colours of the Ukrainian flag. The slogan translates as, Crimea will be Ukrainian or peopleless, in the sense of uninhabited, wasted or empty. In other words, the right sector crazies were willing to kill as many locals as needed, even all, to keep their grip on Crimea. Here is a letter that I received from Lady Crimea 
on February 25. This is just three days after Yanukovych was ousted. I am in real danger. I'm very scared. Peaceful demonstrators carry weapons. These people proclaim nationalist slogans. They are not considered with the opinion of other people. About 2,000 people with arms keep in fear all people in Ukraine. I do not know what the media say in your country, but this is not democracy. I see only violence, cruelty, evil. We are afraid of these demonstrators. We fear for our lives. They come to our city with arms under the banner of peaceful demonstrators. Do you think it looks like a democracy? The following day, February 26, I received another letter. Now people play off against each other. Someone wants to start a civil war. I think that people who went to the Maidan were just pawns in someone's geopolitical game. I love my home, but the people who came to power illegally cannot rule the country. Crimea resists and does not intend to obey the bandits with weapons in hand. Now only Russia can help us defend our rights. People who came to the authority want to ban Russian language and make it a minority language. But 95% of the Crimean population and half of the population of Ukraine speak Russian language. Because now there are double standards. People with bats and guns are peaceful demonstrators. And the people who come up against these thugs are separatists. By this logic, I too am a separatist although I do not consider myself such. On March 1, with violence escalating, the Prime Minister of Crimea, Sergei Aksyonov, sent a public plea for help to Putin, asking him to help protect the people of Crimea. With full understanding of my responsibility for the lives and security of our citizens, I call on the President of the Russian Federation, Vladimir Putin, to provide assistance in securing peace on the territory of the Autonomous Republic of Crimea. A Kremlin source said it would not leave unnoticed the request from Sergei Aksyonov. We also began to see armed, unmarked troops take control of government buildings, the airport and strategic positions. Here is a segment from a Putin press conference on March 4. A few days ago, a group of armed people tried to seize the building of the Crimean Supreme Council. Of course, this caused a lot of concern for Crimeans. It seemed like they would like to do the same thing in Crimea as they did in Kyiv. And they would like to start a series of terrorist attacks and chaos there. And Crimeans were alarmed. That's why they set up those self-defense committees and uh, assumed control over all the armed forces. Actually, uh, when I looked at all the military facilities that they now control, it uh, looks like a huge military installation. A lot of uh, anti-air defenses, a large number of troops as 300, so on and so forth, but without a single shot, all this is now being controlled by the people of Crimea. People who blockaded military installation in Crimea were in uniform that looks very much like Russian uniform. Uh, were they Russian soldiers? Well, look at the former Soviet republics, because uh, the, there are a lot of uniforms that looks like uh, you can go to a store, buy uniform, were these Russian soldiers? No. These were local self-defense forces. And uh, they are very well trained, because if you compare them to militias in Kyiv, well, look at the people who operated in Crimea. They were, and I don't mean, I mean in Kyiv. They were well trained. They were trained at uh, special camps in neighboring countries, Poland, Lithuania, and also inside Ukraine. They were trained by special instructors. They were trained a long time because they have divisions, they're divided in hundreds and tens, and they have, uh, they're very well coordinated, they're very professional, they're just like special forces. Why do you think that 
Self-defense forces in Crimea should be less trained. Only people who live in a certain territory have the right to decide their own future. Here is my letter from Lady Crimea on March 18. You should know the truth. Do not listen. False media. I just saw what the USA media shows and was shocked. You need to know the truth. I know that the American media say false information, doing the same Ukrainian TV channels. I'm from the Crimea. I attended a referendum and it was my own initiative. All my family, relatives, friends and acquaintances also went to the referendum, made their choice. I am not afraid to walk around the city because I know that we are protected and we're safe. People who stand at the entrance to the Crimea, these guys defense of Crimea. We are happy that they do not allow people with guns, explosives and poison to infiltrate our city. We are proud of our defenders. We love them with all our heart. These are our men. Here, no Russian troops. Here, our men. All the cities of the Crimea, all men enrolled in the self-defense of the Crimea. And now they stand on border protection to prevent provocations. In our cities, there are no troops. All is quiet and peaceful. Please do not believe the false media. All Ukrainian American channels do not speak the truth. This is an information war against the Crimea and Russia. In other regions of the country, now in chaos, Maidenovtsi come to eastern and southern regions with guns and behave very aggressively. All these days, all Crimea celebrate joining with the Russian Federation. It is our desire and we are very happy as ever. As inhabitant of the Crimea, I tell you in all sincerity that we love Russia. We are also Russian. We are happy that Putin was not indifferent to our pleas and requests for help. Now we pray for the east of Ukraine. This last sentence holds much greater significance for us now than it did when I first read it. The issue of Russian troops in Crimea has drawn fierce reactions. The Western media chooses to portray this as a Russian invasion. We must understand that Russia has a naval base in Sevastopol, then under contract with the Ukrainian government, an allowance for 25,000 troops, as well as considerable military hardware. Russia usually had around 11,000 troops in Crimea. Russia had every legal right to bring in troops up to the quota. Putin has recently stated, as we didn't exceed the number of personnel on our base in Crimea, strictly speaking, nothing was violated. This is the transcript from the Putin March 4 press conference. The people who were blocking the Ukrainian army units in Crimea were wearing uniforms that strongly resembled the Russian army uniform. Were those Russian soldiers, Russian military? Why don't you take a look at the post-Soviet states? There are many uniforms there that are similar. You can go to a store and buy any kind of uniform. But were they Russian soldiers or not? Those were local self-defense units. Here is how Anthropolitia.net described those uniforms. In fact, to most Russians, these troops did not look too familiar. Their uniforms seemed different from the uniform of the Russian army. Here is a video segment of a soldier in Crimea being interviewed by a Kiev journalist. Now this soldier admits, quite proudly in my observation, that his uniform is new. He also admits that we are local. And when asked if he is Ukrainian, he hesitates, turns away and then replies, we are Russians. 
Lady Crimea, in her letter to me, also declared that she is Russian. For the Russian population in Crimea, most would have been totally disgusted with the events that they had witnessed in Kiev earlier, as well as what happened to Crimeans in Korsan, and keen to remove themselves completely from any notion that they are Ukrainian. This is how a Moscow Times journalist reported from a blocked Ukrainian military base on March 6, where he questioned the seemingly Russian soldiers. Who are you? Where do you come from? Do you miss home? Of course not, one of them said. Even though the soldiers are heavily armed, some locals said they offered insufficient protection of Crimean military bases against supposed armed radicals from the West. Now I will speculate that in view of Russia having a substantial military base in Crimea, I think it would have been a very simple task to assemble a force of tens of thousands of local Crimean men, supply them with nice new uniforms bought from Putin's store, hang a Kalashnikov around their necks as reported with magazines removed, and with some limited training, hey presto, an instant army to impress. There would have also been retired and ex-Russian military personnel in Crimea, as well as current local military personnel to draw upon, along with ample military hardware at the base. Putin has admitted on April 17 that Crimean self-defense forces were of course backed by Russian servicemen. Here is a grab from a Q&A. Another text message uh, is saying, so who were those young people? They look so much like our guys. Those polite uh, young gentlemen, you mean, are in green uniform? I already mentioned that, and I uh, mentioned that a few times before, in publicly and in my conversations with my uh, foreign colleagues, and I, uh, our task was to ensure that there are conditions for the free expression of the will of Crimeans. We had to take measures to avoid this situation developing along the way it is now going in uh, eastern Ukraine to avoid tanks, to avoid radicals and uh, nationalists uh, well armed with automatic weapons uh, behind the self-defense units of Crimea. Of course, we had our servicemen. They were acting uh, very uh, correctly, but at the same time uh, decisively and professionally to conduct a referendum in an open way and help people to express their will. Without that, um, uh, th this expression of uh, their will would be impossible. In Crimea, they have more than 20,000 uh, troops uh, well armed troops and uh, S-300 systems launch sites alone were about uh, three dozens of them and the warehouses uh, with uh, weapons and uh, trains with uh, ammunition, so we had to protect the civilian population from even a slightest opportunity for those uh, weapons to be used against them. But there is more to this story. What really happened overnight in Crimea on February 28? The Saker reports on a series of events. This night sure was interesting. It appears that a group of unidentified armed men took control of the Belbek and Simferopol airports and according to some reports of an air traffic control facility then left. They kept a low profile, were extremely polite and said that they had come to prevent a Ukrainian paratrooper force from landing but that this had been a false alarm. They then apologised and left the pro-nationalist media first accused the Black Sea Fleet, which immediately issued a denial. Then they blamed the Russian Spetsnaz, GRU, for the operation. Interestingly, a group of Mi-24 attack helicopters was seen flying in the direction of the Belbek airport the same day and filmed by a civilian driver on the highway.
Also, a detachment of Ukrainian border guards in Balaclava have been surrounded by what the nationalists claim is a Russian naval infantry unit, which, according to the same sources, declared that their mission was to prevent weapons from falling into the hands of insurgents. Finally, it was reported that a Turkish airliner which was scheduled to land in Crimea decided to turn around and fly back upon hearing the news of the seizure of the airports. What does all that mean? My sense is that something triggered an alert on the Russian side, possibly the arrival of the Turkish aircraft. After all, why did it turn back instead of either landing like other aircraft did or land somewhere nearby? Could it be that there was something aboard this plane which the Turks did not want the Russians to seize? Concerning the helicopters seen, these are MI-24, which the Black Sea Fleet does not use. As far as I know, the only MI-24 unit of the Russian Navy is the 125th Independent Helicopter Squadron of the Baltic Fleet, and it is based in Chkalovsk, near Kaliningrad, very far from Ukraine. I have the feeling that the nationalists are saying the truth when they claim that Russian combat helicopters have crossed the border and executed some mission in the Crimea. But if Russia thought that some threat justified sending in 12 Mi-24s in broad daylight, could it also have sent in some Spetsnaz units? I would say that yes, this is possible. So again, I think that the nationalists who claimed that what they saw was a Spetsnaz GRU operation might well be right. So my sense is that there was some threat which was perceived serious enough by the Russian military to send in troops from across the border. Probably not because of any shortage of manpower locally, but because specialised troops were better suited to the mission. The Russian Spetsnaz secured the airports the naval infantry unit blocked the Ukrainian border guard, while the local volunteer militias were used to shut down the roads and assure general protection. The threat then receded and Russians left their positions and withdrew. This sequence of events perhaps becomes a little clearer with a hacked email. The well-known hacker group Anonymous posted online the correspondence between the deputy head of the Ukrainian nationalists and the deputy chairman of Crimea Tatar Mejlis. One of the hackers writes, it was a hard job, but we have still managed to hack an email of the Maidan activists. Surprisingly, the nationalists have developed links with the Crimean Tatars. As a background to this, the Crimean Tatars don't have a great history with Russia, having been severely persecuted under Stalin they represent a minority population in Crimea of some 12% of the local population. Hackers posted a quote from one of the emails. Everything is going according to the plan. We are ready to proceed with the second part of the play. As agreed earlier last week, my guys together with people will arrive wherever is needed and with the necessary weapons. You only need to let us know the addresses of the warehouses in Simferopol, Sevastopol, Kerch, Feodosia and Yalta and the time of the meeting. Moonofalabama.org reported on March 1 that the Governmental Intelligence Organization of Turkey organized the transfer of separatist jihadist Tatars trained in Turkey to the Ukraine earlier on the 22nd of November. A lot of people might consider that the Ukrainian nationalists and the Crimean Tatars pursue different goals, and their union at first glance looks quite unnatural. However, they have one aim in common, which is to eliminate the Russian-speaking population from the Crimean region, and for that their union is necessary in pursuing the common strategic objective. Now I will let my audience decide if the picture that this series of reports portrays is likely to be accurate. I will only say that if it is, then threats of this nature need to be dealt with decisively and effectively. 
What happened in Crimea was what I would describe as a military presence or occupation. Its purpose was to take control of a threatening and escalating situation, to restore law and order, eliminate provocations, and to protect the safety and rights of the local community. The word invade means to enter with hostile intent. If there is no hostile intent, it cannot be termed an invasion. 60% of Crimeans are ethnic Russians. The Crimean community had been flirting with the idea of reunification with Russia for a decade prior. Putin has recently admitted that the decision to give Crimea an opportunity to choose if it wants to be a part of Russia again was made after an unofficial survey showed the majority of Crimeans would back reunification. We couldn't abandon the territory and people who live there. Couldn't just throw them under this nationalist bulldozer. We found out that 75% of respondents there wanted Crimea to join Russia. This crisis provided the moment to act decisively. Of course, Russia had another priority. Its naval base in the Black Sea port of Sevastopol is of vital strategic importance. Russia simply could not allow Sevastopol to become a NATO base. The moment I personally saw those troops in Crimea, I felt an immediate sense of relief. Someone had taken control of a threatening situation, contrasting completely to the events we had witnessed in Kiev a week earlier. We must not forget that the people of Crimea voted overwhelmingly in the affirmative, and expectedly so. The right to self-determination is the cardinal principle of modern international law, cardinal meaning, chief or most important. Their voice represents democracy in its purest form. Who cares if it wasn't achieved in ideal circumstances? The referendum was monitored by monitors from several countries without reports of any irregularities. The people of Crimea requested reunification with Russia and Russia has accepted their request. Here is my letter from Lady Crimea on March 19. It's really awesome. Are you agree with me? I am happy that now is part of the Russian Crimea. This photo of the holiday in Sevastopol, 17th of March, people celebrated the results of the referendum on the central square of the city. It was a great event. I feel pride for our people. Many adults say they have not seen such patriotism since Yuri Gagarin was launched into space. At home, I also have a Russian flag. Now, I personally have no problem with a community that chooses to defend its own safety and rights. I have no problem with a brotherly nation that assists this community to this aim. We must also remember that Crimea was historically part of Russia. It was reallocated in a constitutionally illegal transfer by Khrushchev in 1954, whilst under the umbrella of the Soviet Union which of course, at that time, wasn't so significant. In closing, I would describe this event as the implementation of a military presence. I can only describe the outcome as the reunification of Crimea with Russia. Well done, Crimea. Well done, Russia. <laughs>